Chapter Thirteen, Part Three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Thirteen, The Reign of Diocletian and His Three Associates, Part Three. While the East anxiously expected the decision of this great contest, the Emperor Diocletian, having assembled in Syria a strong army of observation, displayed from a distance the resources of the Roman power, and reserved himself for any future emergency of the war. On the intelligence of the victory he condescended to advance towards the frontier, with a view of moderating, by his presence and counsels, the pride of Galerius. The interview of the Roman princes at Nisibis was accompanied with every expression of respect on one side, and of esteem on the other. It was in that city that they soon afterwards gave audience to the ambassador of the great king. The power, or at least the spirit, of Narses had been broken by his last defeat, and he considered an immediate peace as the only means that could stop the progress of the Roman arms. He dispatched Afarban, a servant who possessed his favour and confidence, with a commission to negotiate a treaty, or rather to receive whatever conditions the conqueror should impose. Afarban opened the conference by expressing his master's gratitude for the generous treatment of his family, and by soliciting the liberty of those illustrious captives. He celebrated the valour of Galerius without degrading the reputation of Narses, and thought it no dishonour to confess the superiority of the victorious Caesar, over a monarch who had surpassed in glory all the princes of his race. Notwithstanding the justice of the Persian cause, he was empowered to submit the present differences to the decision of the emperors themselves, convinced as he was that in the midst of prosperity they would not be unmindful of the vicissitudes of fortune. Afarban concluded his discourse in the style of Eastern allegory, by observing that the Roman and Persian monarchies were the two eyes of the world which would remain imperfect and mutilated if either of them should be put out. "'It well becomes the Persians,' replied Galerius, with a transport of fury which seemed to convulse his whole frame. It well becomes the Persians to expiate on the vicissitudes of fortune, and calmly to read us lectures on the virtues of moderation. Let them remember their own moderation towards the unhappy Valerian. They vanquished him by fraud, they treated him with indignity, they detained him till the last moment of his life in shameful captivity, and after his death they exposed his body to perpetual ignominy. Softening, however, his tone, Galerius insinuated to the ambassador that it had never been the practice of the Romans to trample on a prostrate enemy, and that on this occasion they should consult their own dignity rather than the Persian merit. He dismissed Afarban with a hope that Narses would soon be informed on what conditions he might obtain from the clemency of the emperors a lasting peace, and the restoration of his wives and children. In this conference we may discover the fierce passions of Galerius, as well as his deference to the superior wisdom and authority of Diocletian. The ambition of the former grasped at the conquest of the East, and had proposed to reduce Persia into the state of a province. The prudence of the latter, who adhered to the moderate policy of Augustus and the Antonines, embraced the favourable opportunity of terminating a successful war by an honourable and advantageous peace. In pursuance of their promise, the emperors soon afterwards appointed Sicorius Probus, one of their secretaries, to acquaint the Persian court with their final resolution. As the minister of peace he was received with every mark of politeness and friendship, but under the pretence of allowing him the necessary repose after so long a journey, the audience of Probus was deferred from day to day, and he attended the slow motions of the king till at length he was admitted to his presence near the river Asprudus in Media. The secret motive of Narses in this delay had been to collect such a military force as might enable him, though sincerely desirous of peace, to negotiate with the greater weight and dignity. Three persons only assisted at this important conference. 
the minister, Afaban, the prefect of the guards, and an officer who had commanded on the Armenian frontier. The first condition proposed by the ambassador is not at present of a very intelligible nature, that the city of Nisibis might be established for the place of mutual exchange, or, as we should formerly have termed it, for the staple of trade between the two empires. There is no difficulty in conceiving the intention of the Roman princes to improve their revenue by some restraints upon commerce, but as Nisibis was situated within their own dominions, and as they were masters both of the imports and exports, it should seem that such restraints were the objects of an internal law rather than a foreign treaty. To render them more effectual, some stipulations were probably required on the side of the King of Persia, which appeared so very repugnant either to his interest or to his dignity that Narses could not be persuaded to subscribe them. As this was the only article to which he refused his consent, it was no longer insisted on, and the emperors either suffered the trade to flow in its natural channels, or contented themselves with such restrictions as it depended on their own authority to establish. As soon as this difficulty was removed, a solemn peace was concluded and ratified between the two nations. The conditions of a treaty so glorious to the empire and so necessary to Persia may deserve a more peculiar attention, as the history of Rome presents very few transactions of a similar nature, most of her wars having either been terminated by absolute conquest or waged against barbarians ignorant of the use of letters. The Aboras, or, as it is called by Xenophon, the Araxes, was fixed as the boundary between the two monarchies. That river, which rose near the Tigris, was increased a few miles below Nisibis by the little stream of the Migdonius, passed under the walls of Singara, and fell into the Euphrates, at Circasium, a frontier town which, by the care of Diocletian, was very strongly fortified. Mesopotamia, the object of so many wars, was ceded to the empire, and the Persians, by this treaty, renounced all pretensions to that great province. They relinquished to the Romans five provinces beyond the Tigris. Their situation formed a very useful barrier, and the natural strength was soon improved by art and military skill. Four of these, to the north of the river, were districts of obscure fame and inconsiderable extent. Intilini, Zabdikini, Artzanini, and Moxoini. But on the east of the Tigris, the empire acquired the large and mountainous territory of Carduini, the ancient seat of the Carducians, who preserved for many ages their manly freedom in the heart of the despotic monarchies of Asia. The ten thousand Greeks traversed their country, after a painful march, or rather engagement, of seven days, and it is confessed by their leader, in his uncomparable relation of the retreat, that they suffered more from the arrows of the Carducians than from the power of the great king. Their posterity, the Kurds, with very little alteration either of name or manners, acknowledged the nominal sovereignty of the Turkish sultan. It is almost needless to observe that Tiridates, the faithful ally of Rome, was restored to the throne of his fathers, and that the rights of the imperial supremacy were fully asserted and secured. The limits of Armenia were extended as far as the fortress of Cintha in Media, and this increase of dominion was not so much an act of liberality as of justice. Of the provinces already mentioned beyond the Tigris, the first four had been dismembered by the Parthians from the crown of Armenia, and when the Romans acquired the possession of them, they stipulated, at the expense of the usurpers, an ample compensation, which invested their ally with the extensive and fertile country of Atropatini. Its principal city, in the same situation perhaps as the modern Tauris, was frequently honoured by the residence of Tiridates and, as it sometimes bore the name of Ekbatana, he imitated, in the buildings and fortifications, the splendid capital of the Medes. The country of Iberia was barren, its inhabitants rude and savage, but they were accustomed to the use of arms, and they separated from the empire barbarians much fiercer and more formidable than themselves. The narrow defiles of Mount Caucasus were in their hands, and it was in their choice either to admit or exclude the wandering tribes of Sarmatia, whenever a rapacious spirit urged them to penetrate into the richer climes of the south. 
The nomination of the kings of Iberia, which was resigned by the Persian monarch to the emperors, contributed to the strength and security of the Roman power in Asia. The East enjoyed a profound tranquillity during forty years, and the treaty between the rival monarchies was strictly observed until the death of Tiridates, when a new generation, animated with different views and different passions, succeeded to the government of the world, and the grandson of Narses undertook a long and memorable war against the princes of the house of Constantine. The arduous work of rescuing the distressed empire from tyrants and barbarians had now been completely achieved by a succession of Illyrian peasants. As soon as Diocletian entered into the twentieth year of his reign, he celebrated that memorable ira as well as the success of his arms by the pomp of a Roman triumph. Maximian, the equal partner of his power, was his only companion in the glory of that day. The two Caesars had fought and conquered, but the merit of their exploits was ascribed, according to the rigour of ancient maxims, to the auspicious influence of their fathers and emperors. The triumph of Diocletian and Maximian was less magnificent, perhaps, than those of Aurelian and Probus, but it was dignified by several circumstances of superior fame and good fortune. Africa and Britain, the Rhine, the Danube, and the Nile furnished their respective trophies, but the most distinguished ornament was of a more singular nature, a Persian victory followed by an important conquest. The representations of rivers, mountains and provinces were carried before the imperial car. The images of the captive wives, the sisters, and the children of the great king afforded a new and grateful spectacle to the vanity of the people. In the eyes of posterity this triumph is remarkable by a distinction of a less honourable kind. It was the last that Rome ever beheld. Soon after this period the emperors ceased to vanquish, and Rome ceased to be the capital of the empire. The spot on which Rome was founded had been consecrated by ancient ceremonies and imaginary miracles. The presence of some god or the memory of some hero seemed to animate every part of the city, and the empire of the world had been promised to the capital. The native Romans felt and confessed the power of this agreeable illusion. It was derived from their ancestors had grown up with their earliest habits of life, and was protected in some measure by the opinion of political utility. The form and the seat of government were intimately blended together, nor was it esteemed possible to transport the one without destroying the other. But the sovereignty of the capital was gradually annihilated in the extent of conquest, the provinces rose to the same level, and the vanquished nations acquired the name and privileges without imbibing the partial affections of Romans. During a long period, however, the remains of the ancient constitution and the influence of custom preserved the dignity of Rome. The emperors, though perhaps of African or Illyrian extraction, respected their adopted country as the seat of their power and the centre of their extensive dominions. The emergencies of war very frequently required their presence on the frontiers, but Diocletian and Maximian were the first Roman princes who fixed, in time of peace, their ordinary residence in the provinces, and their conduct, however it might be suggested by private motives, was justified by very specious considerations of policy. The court of the Emperor of the West was, for the most part, established at Milan whose situation at the foot of the Alps appeared far more convenient than that of Rome, for the important purpose of watching the motions of the barbarians of Germany. Milan soon assumed the splendour of an imperial city. The houses are described as numerous and well-built, the manners of the people as polished and liberal. A circus, a theatre, a mint, a palace, baths which bore the name of their founder Maximian, porticoes adorned with statues, and a double circumference of walls contributed to the beauty of the new capital. Nor did it seem oppressed even by the proximity of Rome. To rival the majesty of Rome was an ambitious likewise of Diocletian, who employed his leisure and the wealth of the East in the embellishment of Nicomedia, a city placed on the verge of Europe and Asia, 
almost an equal distance between the Danube and the Euphrates. By the taste of the monarch, and at the expense of the people, Nicomedia acquired in the space of a few years a degree of magnificence which might appear to have required the labour of ages, and became inferior only to Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch in extent of populousness. The life of Diocletian and Maximian was a life of action, and a considerable portion of it was spent in camps, or in the long and frequent marches, but whenever the public business allowed them any relaxation they seemed to have retired with pleasure to their favourite residences of Nicomedia and Milan. Till Diocletian, in the twentieth year of his reign, celebrated his Roman triumph, it is extremely doubtful whether he ever visited the ancient capital of the empire. Even on that memorable occasion his stay did not exceed two months. Disgusted with the licentious familiarity of the people, he quitted Rome with precipitation thirteen days before it was expected that he should have appeared in the Senate, invested with the ensigns of the consular dignity. The dislike expressed by Diocletian towards Rome, and Roman freedom, was not the effect of momentary caprice, but the result of the most artful policy. That crafty prince had framed a new system of imperial government, which was afterwards completed by the family of Constantine, and, as the image of the old constitution was religiously preserved in the Senate, he resolved to deprive that order of its small remains of power and consideration. We may recollect, about eight years before the elevation, of Diocletian the transient greatness and the ambitious hopes of the Roman Senate. As long as that enthusiasm prevailed, many of the nobles imprudently displayed their zeal in the cause of freedom, and, after the successes of Probus had withdrawn their countenance from the Republican party, the senators were unable to disguise their impotent resentment. As the sovereign of Italy, Maximian was entrusted with the care of extinguishing this troublesome rather than dangerous spirit, and the task was perfectly suited to his cruel temper. The most illustrious members of the Senate, whom Diocletian always affected to esteem, were involved by his colleague in the accusation of imaginary plots, and the possession of an elegant villa or a well-cultivated estate was interpreted as a convincing evidence of guilt. The camp of the Praetorians, which had so long oppressed, began to protect the majesty of Rome, and as those haughty troops were conscious of the decline of their power, they were naturally disposed to unite their strength with the authority of the Senate. By the prudent measures of Diocletian, the numbers of the Praetorians were insensibly reduced, their privileges abolished, and their place supplied by two faithful legions of Illyricum, who, under the new titles of Jovians and Herculeans, were appointed to perform the service of the Imperial Guards. But the most fatal, though secret, wound which the Senate received from the hands of Diocletian and Maximian was inflicted by the inevitable operation of their absence. As long as the emperors resided at Rome, that assembly might be oppressed, but it could scarcely be neglected. The successors of Augustus exercised the power of dictating whatever laws their wisdom or caprice might suggest, but those laws were ratified by the sanction of the Senate. The model of ancient freedom was preserved in his deliberations and decrees, and wise princes, who respected the prejudices of the Roman people, were in some measure obliged to assume the language and behaviour suitable to the general and first magistrate of the Republic. In the armies, and in the provinces, they displayed the dignity of monarchs, and when they fixed their residence at a distance from the capital, they for ever laid aside the dissimulation which Augustus had recommended to his successors. In the exercise of the legislative as well as the executive power, the sovereign advised with his ministers, instead of consulting the great council of the nation. The name of the Senate was mentioned with honour till the last period of the empire. The vanity of its members was still flattered with honorary distinctions, but the assembly which had so long been the source, and so long the instrument of power, was respectfully suffered to sink into oblivion. The Senate of Rome, losing all connection with the imperial court and the actual constitution, was left a venerable but useless monument of antiquity on the Capitoline Hill. End of chapter 13, part 3